So it's Confirmation Sunday, and we've had these young people who have been spending several months, at least since early September, learning about the church. They've been learning about their faith, and they've been deciding for themselves if they're ready to step into their own shoes and take radical responsibility for their lives and for their discipleship, their fellowship in Jesus. And special thanks, and Fred, in case I forget, for our director of discipleship, Jill Sin. Where are you, Jill? Stand up, Jill. Because Jill really is the person on staff, the, the minister, she's in seminary right now, who has organized this program and poured into these youth and, and these families, and it, it takes a village, and we're grateful for your leadership. So I want to talk a little bit about discipleship. I, don't, I know you confirmands know what it means to be a disciple, but I can't take for granted that everyone gathered here and those tuning in know what Christian discipleship really is, Okay. You know, the mission of our church is to what? Make disciples of Jesus Christ. And in the United Methodist Church, we tacked on another part of that. It's to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So what is a disciple? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, you get several explanations. But simply put, a disciple is a learner, a student, a follower of Jesus Christ. What I want you to know about discipleship, and this is the thesis for my sermon, is that discipleship is a journey, and it's a lifelong journey. We never outgrow. So, confirmands, don't get the idea that you have gone through all these classes, you've had a mentor, you've thought about your faith. Don't think that you are now graduating. That's not what's happening here. You've just begun. And we're all, on some level, growing in God's grace. I like what Leonard Sweet says about discipleship. He compares it, Jeannie, to playing an instrument. Not everyone can play at the level of musicality that you can play in other musicians here. Some of us are like, if we were learning to play an instrument, I would be like scratching it out on the violin. Do you get the tune? Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> So we're all on some continuum, you know, at different levels in the journey of Christian discipleship. And we should be patient with each other because we're all precious and beautiful in God's sight and created in God's image. But we're at different different places on the journey. One of my favorite authors, you hear me talk about him all the time, and it's Ron Rollheiser. He's a Catholic priest. He's from Canada. And I think he's the contemporary Henry Nouwen of the day. And we're reading a Lenten devotional, and I forgot to mention it, called Daybreaks. And after this service, immediately following the service, or as soon as we all get settled and on our way, I will meet whoever wants to gather in the substory, and we'll spend about 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, going over some of these readings, watching over each other in love, and just spending time together talking about what God's doing in our lives. So if you want to join us, please do. And that happens in the substory. But Ron Rollheiser is written extensively on the topic of discipleship. And he's written so extensively is that he's writing a trilogy. And he's already written not one book, not two, but he's working on the third. And he breaks, he divides discipleship into three phases, okay? He calls the first phase essential discipleship, which is the struggle... And he uses that word because is life a struggle? It's a blessing, but is it a struggle? Yes. From day one, when we're born into the world, we're struggling with what it means to be here, to live, to to belong. And by the way, this isn't just for Christians. It's really for everybody. And so this first level, first phase of discipleship is essential discipleship, and it's the struggle to get our lives together. And then we enter in to generative discipleship. And he says this is the struggle to give our lives away. And then the third phase of discipleship is radical discipleship. And this is the struggle to give our deaths away. And so if you want to read more about it, you can read about essential discipleship in his book, The Holy Longing. 
You can read about generative discipleship in what I think is his best book called Sacred Fire, and he hasn't published yet, I think he's working on it, the one on radical discipleship. So stay tuned, more to come. Let's talk a little bit about essential discipleship. The struggle to what? Get our lives together. Now, this is where you compromands are, by the way. Now, I'm not trying to, like, put you on the spot, but just go with me here. For most of your life, you were born into the world trying to figure out your identity, but for most of your lives up to this point, who has had primary responsibility for your life, your maturation? Parents. Good answer, whoever said that. Your parents have taken you to church. They've, they've given you things to read. They've told you, to what, you know, what they believe and talked to you about it and that sort of thing. But what we're saying with your confirmation at the age that you are is that, and by the way, confirm just means make solid, you know, a solid foundation. And, and what you're saying is, I'm going to take, I'm going to start taking the steps towards my own responsibility for my life. Up to this point, your parents. But now you're saying, I'm going to start thinking for myself. I'm going to start discerning who to trust. I'm going to start thinking about what I really believe and what brings meaning to my life. And this is all about developing your identity. And so you're going to be needing to pray this prayer, if we can show the slide. This is the primary prayer. We need to pray all kinds of things. But the primary prayer for this stage of discipleship is guide me, Lord. Say that with me. Guide me, Lord. And the reason you want God's guidance, we need God's guidance all the time, but especially in this essential phase, is because you're going to be making decisions about where to go to college, who you're going to hang out with, your friends. And Andy Stanley says this, and I believe it. Your friends, who you hang out with, who you spend most of your time with, will set the direction, the quality and direction of your life. So you got to be praying Man, Jesus, should I hang out with this person or not? Should I trust this person or not? You're going to want to be praying for guidance about whether or not you're even called to be married. Some people are called to it. Some are not. You're going to want to ask God to guide you about who to marry. Don't settle. Wait for God to show you who to spend the rest of your life with because it's a pretty big deal, isn't it, church? But you're going to be asking things like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to study? What do I want to become? And you're going to need God's guidance. This is a very exciting time in your life. Let God in and ask God to show you what to do with your life. Now, a lot of people enter this time in their teens, their 20s, their 30s, but, but it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Fits all. So I can't tell you how long this phase lasts. But again, it's about developing, building your life, getting your lives together. Guide me, Lord. Now, this second phase is called the generative phase. He also calls it the mature discipleship. Now, this phase, depending on your maturity, you know, you may be in your 30s, like I said, or 20s, 30s, 40s. But this usually is the stage that lasts the longest. And this is when we begin to make that shift. We're, we're, we're trusting Jesus with our lives, all right? And so because we've been trusting Jesus and turning to Jesus, we begin to make this incredible shift from the selfish to the sacred. Now our lives aren't so much about what we want and need. They're about giving our lives away for others. And so we're asking, the prayer for us is this, use me, Lord. Use me. So every morning I'll pray a prayer that goes something like this. Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And to whom? Use me, Lord. And we're constantly asking ourselves in this phase, if we're a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, if we have employees, whatever we're doing, if we're serving in the church or out in the community, we're constantly asking God, how can I be more generative generous? How can I be more sincere and pure about giving my life away? Use me, Lord. Now, the third phase 
is the phase that we don't like to pay attention to in our culture because our culture is terrified of death. We just want to act like it's not going to happen. But we know it happens to us all. And so this final stage of radical discipleship is the struggle to give our deaths away. Henry Nouwen talked a lot about this. He said, we want to die. The goal of a Christian death, we want to die in such a way that we're more of a blessing instead of a bitter burden. And we know what I'm talking about, you know, the curmudgeons in the world that are so angry and bitter that no one wants to go see them or be around them, you know. But we've just got so much inner chaos and turmoil and victimhood that, that we just aren't that um, fun to be around. Because aging is hard. It's not just hard. It's terrifying. Can I get an amen? But how do we prepare ourselves at the right time, and and all this has to be discerned, so that when we draw those last breaths, we die in such a way that we don't carry on the chaos. We carry on maturity, grace, and blessing. And and Ron Ron Rollheiser says about this stage, it's less active and more passive. Think about all that Jesus did through the passion, through his passive actions on the cross. You see what I'm saying? I think about my mom's death. She died in December of this past year. And it wasn't easy, and there were many challenges and burdens to it. But more than the burdens were the blessings The conversations, the the pep talks she gave us, the friends that loved her so and family that gathered around, the blessing of being able to be with her and her parting in peace. We want to take those final breaths in such a way that we're a blessing and not a burden. And so the prayer here becomes, take me, Lord. Receive me. You see, discipleship is really about, this is what Ron Rollheiser says, sorry to quote him so much, but he's really shaped me on this. Discipleship is about what we do with that fire inside of us. I'm looking out, I know some of you really well, and I know you've got some fire in you. And discipleship is about what we do with that fire inside each and every one of us. And so... Discipleship is not simply about whether or not you come to church. He says, discipleship is more about whether or not you and I can sleep at night. Can I get an amen? Again, one size doesn't fit all, and where you fall in that continuum is highly personal. But what this phase, journey, these three phases remind me of is how there's this balance when it comes to discipleship between willpower and surrender. And what do I mean by that? It takes a lot of willpower to be a disciple. We just need to own that church, even in the evangelical tradition which we are in, the Protestant tradition. You need willpower. This morning, after spending all day long at a college retreat, pouring into young people, beautiful young people as they are, I was there from seven, no, nine until eight at night, and I, it dawned on me this morning, dang it, it's daylight savings time. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in bed thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to say today? And I had to drag myself out of bed, like some of you parents probably had to drag your families out of bed to be here. It's taken willpower for me to show up and be with you today. It took willpower to go through the confirmation classes. It takes willpower to sing an anthem. It takes willpower to read the Bible. This church stuff requires something from us. But it also requires surrender. It's not just about showing up in church. It's about whether or not you and I can sleep soundly at night. And I think the story of the rich young ruler, we're finally going to get to the Bible has a lot to teach teach us about this balance between willpower and surrender when it comes to Christian discipleship. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very important story. It appears, 
You know a story in the Gospels is really important when it appears more than once. And we get this story three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we've heard it so many times that we tend to merge the versions and we tend to, we're so, we over familiarize ourselves. We, we have over familiarized ourselves with the story so much so that we turn the rich young ruler into a villain. Maybe because he's rich. I don't know. But do you know that we don't learn that he's rich or has many possessions until the end of the story? Here's what we know at the beginning of Mark's version of the story. We know that this man is virtuous, he is faithful, he is committed, he is sincere, not unlike our compromands here today. You've been very committed, you've been faithful, you're good, you're exceptional. And so was the rich young ruler. So Jesus is on a journey when this man comes running towards him and he kneels before Jesus. What does kneeling symbolize? Humility. So he's humble, he's faithful, and he asks Jesus, good teacher, which is a respectful term, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says this, you know the commandments, and then he lists several of them. And the the man says, Teacher, I have kept all these commandments from my youth. And then Jesus looked at him. And he loved him. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I think I read this week, it's been a busy week, that this is the only time in the Gospels that we are told specifically that Jesus loved someone. But Jesus looked at the man and he loved him. He sees him. He sees his heart, his soul. He sees that fire inside of him. And it's a beautiful moment. And then Jesus says to him these haunting words, you lack one thing. Go and sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. And the man is shocked. And you know why he's shocked? He's given so much to God. Reminds me of that parable, that other parable in the gospel about the vineyard workers. Some workers work an hour. Some other workers work most of the morning. Other workers work half the day. And then you have those workers, those day laborers that work all day long, and the, they all get paid what? The same. And those workers that have been working all day, hmm, they don't like it because they put in so much Why would God pay everyone the same? Why would God rain on the just and the unjust? Why would God's sunshine shine on the just and the unjust? And so we know the story. The the man will not let go of his possessions, and so he walks away, and he walks away grieving. Now notice that this man is not bad. He's not the villain. He's what? Sad. He's not bad. He's just sad. And why is he sad? Because we're not created in God's image. You and I have not been put on this planet to hoard and protect and preserve our lives. We've we've been put on this planet to give them away. What will it profit you, Jesus says, if you gain the entire world but lose your soul? Now, preachers love to preach this story of the rich young ruler at what time of year? Come on, you know. Stewardship. Because the obvious literal meaning is that you can't, you're not going to experience wholeness and joy as a, as a faithful follower. You're not going to experience wholeness and joy in your beloved faith community if you're not generous with your money. And we do in this world that we're living in, in especially in the United States, money is a big deal. And the reason we need to give our money away from a spiritual point of view is not just to support that this church, which we hope you will do, but it's so that money doesn't have so much power and control yeah. over us. So that is important to remember. But there may be a deeper meaning to this story in that no amount of willpower No amount of our virtuous efforts will bring healing, wholeness, and salvation to our lives and to our world as well. 
ultimately, we have to surrender. And so we get this great illustration in one of Rollheiser's books. He says, I sometimes picture my soul as a mansion with 30 rooms, and I've given 27 of those rooms to God, but I have kept three to myself. What if real conversion means giving up those final three rooms? I have an illustration for us. I know you wanted a short sermon. You didn't get it. Imagine your life has ten boxes. One, two, three, four, five times two is ten. All right. You've given... Now, these boxes represent different things. Things like um, the fear of failure, you know, the, uh, your career, your family... I don't know the complexities of your soul, but God does. And so you have given lots of these blocks away to God, maybe 90%. But what about that 10%? What are you and I holding back from Jesus? That's a loaded question. You don't have to answer now. You lack one thing. Now you see the reason for surrendering. You know, people that go through recovery programs will tell you, you know, there are just some things you can't let go of unless you surrender. Yes, it's about us and our willpower But ultimately, it's about God and our surrendering to God. Jesus says it's easier. You know this metaphor. It's not just a metaphor. It's a hyperbole. Jesus has to really exaggerate so that you and I will get the message. It's easier for what? A camel to get through the eye of a needle than for those with so much to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the disciples, right after Jesus says this, the disciples want to know, then who? Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked. That's what the scripture says. Jesus looked at the disciples. He saw their souls. He saw their hearts. He saw that fire inside of them. And he said this, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are what? Possible. So here's how I want to wrap up. Don't try this alone. You cannot be a follower of Jesus, a disciple all by yourself, left to your own devices. And you need three things, and I'm going to go through them rapidly. You need grace. At every phase and stage and age of our lives, we need the grace of God. And what do I mean by that? God's forgiveness, mercy, power, the Holy Spirit pouring in and through us. We live in a secular world where most people think, I'm fine without God. No, we're not. God is our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, and our willingness to call upon God is everything. So call upon daily at whatever stage you're in. Let us commit to calling upon God and God's grace every moment of our lives. The second thing you need, because you cannot be a Christian all by yourself or a follower of Jesus or even a seeker, you cannot live a meaningful life in this world. I'll take it that far. You cannot be whole. Left to your own devices, you need community. Because the people you spend the most time with, the people you trust your soul with, are going to set the quality and direction of your life. And so you ask God to help you cultivate Christian community, people of faith who will know you, love you, who will want your best. Your best friend should bring out the best in you. I think that's Henry Ford. And at every stage, and when you move, and when you join a new church, I mean, because life is full of changes, ask God to put people in your life who will help you along the way. I want to mention a small group. Lots of you are involved in small groups, but I want to mention this small group. Do we have the picture? This is a group of people who are mostly members of our church, some not yet, and um, they are part of a small group. 
and they meet every Sunday evening without fail. And they're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. I hope they'll let me share that. <laughs> but what I like about this is it's a reminder their preacher didn't tell them to meet. It's not because they're part of a confirmation class. These people get together because they want to deepen their friendship with Jesus. They want to give their lives away at every stage of their lives, and they know they can't do it left to their own devices. So they come together to pray, to read scripture, to just hang out, to watch over each other in love. You need community if you want to follow Jesus and um, be a Christian disciple. Finally, the last thing we all need, no matter the age, stage, or phase, we need patience. God is patient. I never thought about that until I got to this church. <laughs> God is so patient. I want you to think of the most patient person in, the entire, in your entire life. And God is exponentially more patient than even that person. Because, you know why? Nothing sacred happens in a rush, in a hurry. And we have to learn to trust God's patience and understanding and mercy that God has created you and that you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God knows. God sees your fire. God sees your heart. God sees your soul. God sees how complex and crazy you are. And God loves you. When God looks at you, like he did the disciples of long ago, like he did that rich young ruler. When God looks at you, God loves you. In fact, God can't get God's eyes off you. And so what, at whatever phase and stage we're in, let this be our prayer. Guide me, Lord. Use me, Lord. And take me, Lord. So be it, and so it is. Amen.